down, which is when we plan to get started, I'm going to kind of pause for a, probably another minute to see if anybody else uh, wants to show up and uh, don't want them to miss the beginning of the workshop. I'm Christine Wells. I am a member of the UCLA uh, Statistical Consulting Group. Andy Lynn, Johnny Lynn, and Siavash Jalal are also here. Uh, is Shars here? If she is, I, I'm sorry, I can't see who all is here. Shars might also be here. Um, we're all members of the group. And the other members of the group will be uh, handling all of the uh, questions and stuff that uh, audience members put in the chat. Now, it's difficult to make a workshop like this terribly interactive, right? I'm not gonna like stop and ask you to write up results or something like that. But what I am going to do is stop frequently for questions and I really do hope that members of the audience unmute themselves and ask some questions. If you don't want to be on the recording, I, I totally understand that. Uh, your question can be typed into the chat and then one of the um, other consultants can just read it without your name. And I can go ahead and respond to it that way if that's how you'd like to do it. At the end of the workshop, I do have um, kind of exercises or things to practice on, things to think about. And what I thought I would do is go over those with everybody. So we would do it more or less kind of like a group uh, project. I'll give you a couple of minutes to think about, well, you know, how would I respond? What would I do here? How would I handle it? And then we can talk and see the different ideas that the audience members have about how to improve uh, some of the examples that I've come up with. So uh, with all that in mind, if you have found your way to uh, this website here, it's the IDRI Stats website, and this is um, the seminars page right here and the link to our workshop notes are right here. So I'm gonna come here and click, and these are the notes. Now, the way that I've always written workshops is to write out pretty much everything I'm going to say. And my rationale for this isn't that it makes for like a super fabulous, visually stimulating, wonderful, um, uh, thing to look at while I'm talking, but rather you're going to get most of what I say while we're talking here. And over time, you'll remember less and less. But when you need the material, you can come back to the website and it's all written out for you. And so you're not looking at sentence fragments or bullet points and wondering what the uh, message was or what the point was. You can read complete sentences and you can get the gist of what was going on and, and jar your memory that way. So this material is here when you need it, okay? It's been posted on our website for, I don't know, I, I wrote the original one of this like 10 or 12 years ago, and it's been updated over time, but it's, it's on the website. And so you can go back to it whenever you want and um, remind yourself of these points whenever you need that information. And that's why it's all written out like this. So if you wanna just turn off or, you know, uh, not look at this and just listen to me talk, that's completely fine. You'll, you'll get everything out of it. You don't need to read what's on the screen. You can just listen to me and um, go like that. Do we have any questions before we get started? Okay, I don't hear anybody, so I'm going to go ahead and dive in. So we're talking about statistical writing in academic manuscripts. An academic manuscript could be your master's thesis, it could be your dissertation, it could be a paper for publication, or a paper for some other purpose, maybe a conference or something. We're going to be focusing on the results section because we're talking about the statistical writing here. Now, as I'm sure anybody who's ever done research already knows, research itself 
from the beginning to the end, from the hypothesis development through the finished manuscript is a process. And that's the key idea. It's a process. And because it's a process, what comes before influences what comes next. So if you do a great job in the beginning, the next steps will also be great or at least really good and things will go uh, a lot better. So of course, the results section of the manuscript is a product of all of the earlier stages of the research process. You do really well in the beginning, the later parts of the process are also going to be of better quality. What are the main points that I'm going to make today? Plan, 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 plan. I cannot stress this enough. Plan, plan everything from start to finish. Um, there is nothing that is going to save you more time and more frustration than very careful planning. I can't stress that point enough. Do not skimp on the planning. Do not just dive into your research. Oh, I'll figure out what statistics to do uh, once we get there, okay? You're setting yourself up for a really rough, rough road. And where you're really gonna feel that is in doing the statistical analyses and then, um, and then uh, trying to write about them. So, Planning is critical. Tell a cohesive, concise story. Concise, especially when you are writing a paper for publication because most of them have space limits. Uh, some of them count the number of words you have in the manuscript. So concise is necessary. Cohesive is necessary too, or else the reader doesn't get the point. And I can't tell you how many articles I've read where I finished reading the article and said, boy, I wish I knew what the point was. You don't want that said about your article. So it's got to be cohesive. It's got to be concise. Writing concisely is actually really, really difficult. And so if you struggle to do that, you're in very good company. That's a tough thing to do, and it takes a lot of practice. You want to very clearly state your hypotheses and how the analyses you're running relate to each of the hypotheses. There has to be a clear connection between the hypothesis you're testing and the way you're testing it. That's the statistical technique that you're using. You need to make that connection very strong. You need to provide enough detail that your audience can imagine or actually replicate the research you've done. They need to understand why you did what you did. But I will tell you, it's very difficult to include that level of detail in a really concise write-up and still abide by the word count or space limits imposed by the journals. So that is also very difficult. Other tips. OK, I'm going to go back to it. You know it. Planning is important. What are, what's involved here? First of all, a lot of people have to do a priori power analyses. A lot of people really despise those because they're difficult to do and they involve a lot of guessing. And while I certainly understand those criticisms, what they really force you to do is even more planning. And I like them for that aspect of it, that you have to do very, very careful planning. If you are doing something that is somewhat new to you, a new statistical technique or something like that, we always suggest that people take classes to learn about the statistical technique, when it can be used, when it cannot be used, what are its limitations, what are its assumptions, what happens when those assumptions get violated. That's the kind of stuff that you're going to learn in a class. And when I started writing this, like I said, it was about 10 years ago, that was really a tough thing to say to consulting clients because they would very legitimately say back, well, you know, this class runs at UCLA once a year and it's not going to run for another nine months. What do I do between now and then? 
or you know, this class isn't even offered at UCLA. Believe it or not, there are some classes that aren't offered at UCLA. It's surprising, but it's true. And that was then and this is now. So just actually, I think it was yesterday, I was reading on some news site and they listed 25 free places where you could take academic courses. And I noted down uh, nine of those that I believe actually contain stuff on data analysis, statistics, and stuff that's relevant. They include Coursera, Academic Earth, Stanford Online, Open Yale Courses, UC Berkeley Class Central, Carnegie Mellon Open Learning Initiative, the Open University, MIT Open Courseware, the University of Oxford has podcasts, and one I just threw in myself is the Stata YouTube channel. Now, even if you're not a Stata user, you can learn an awful lot about statistical analysis and interpretation of those analyses from watching the free Stata YouTube videos. And I stress that one uh, simply because only people from Stata Corp can post to their YouTube channel. And most of those folks are actually faculty at the nearby university. So it is very high quality. It is geared towards people who are learning the material. And all of this is free. Uh, also, uh, places like uh, Curran and Bauer sometimes offer free or low cost um, courses. They've got uh, some course running from now until December. I think it's like 50 bucks. And uh, there are also one off things. Michael Bornstein, for example, puts out um, little classes or an hour long thing on a specific topic in meta analysis, and those are free. So nowadays you have all sorts of really high quality free resources for learning about the statistical techniques that you're using. Also pay attention to statistical software packages. When you're planning, please make sure that the software package that you like to use can do the analysis that you want to do. Or if you're gonna say do, I don't know, um, propensity scores with your regression, or you're going to do multiply imputed data with multi-level or something, make sure that the software can actually do those two things together. Um, you'll find that some software packages are better than that, better at that than others. And you don't want to be caught off guard just because the software package will do both things, but won't do them together. So the more you understand about the statistical technique, the easier it's going to be for you to describe it to others. The first time you run an ordinary least squares regression, you're going to have a beast of a time writing about those results. The hundredth time you've done an OLS regression, you are just going to sit down and type it up easy peasy. So that means practice is what's really important. So how do you practice this stuff? It turns out that almost maybe all statistical software actually comes with built in example data sets. And most of the software with which I'm familiar actually has example data sets associated with every procedure, almost every procedure available in the software. And so you can go take that example data set and start practicing analyses, uh, make mistakes, see what kind of error messages you get, figure it out, get some practice analyzing data, interpreting those results, try writing about it once or twice. Just get some practice there so that when you're ready to go write up your results, it's not your first time out of the gate. The distance between writing the results and being, a, excuse me, the distance between getting the results and writing about them expands with the complexity of the analysis. So if you ran a chi-square or a correlation, you probably get the result and you can start writing a couple minutes later. That's not, you know, they're, they're kind of easier statistical techniques and writing about them isn't all that difficult. If you are running, say, a multi-level structural equation modeling, 
there's probably going to be a fair amount of time before you get your results and the time you can sit down and start writing about it because you've got to kind of process it yourself and think things through. And so that's what I mean about there's sometimes some distance between getting the results and actually being able to sit down and write about them. I have some friends who like what they call the grandma technique. Uh, the grandma technique that basically try to explain it to your grandmother or your spouse, significant other, roommate, whomever is available, an intelligent person, but somebody who is not uh, in, in your field of research, you know, a lab mate might not be the best choice, but try to explain it to somebody else. And if you can explain it to someone else and they get it, well, now you're definitely able to sit down and start writing. I warn you, however, do not discuss it with your cat. I've tried this. They don't actually have facial muscles, so they can't like look at you like you're crazy and that blank look over and over again not informative and then the cat falls asleep and you just kind of feel crushed so avoid cats talk to humans talk to cats about other things but not statistics there's no relationship between the amount of time it took you to do something and the amount of space it gets in the write-up <laughs> and i forgot some precious memories of back when we had walk-in statistical consulting of some clients who were doing what were they doing the um, diagnostics for some regression analyses and they were new to it so it took them a while and they were looking at all these different resources and working out the code and you know diagnostics it's not black and white so there's a lot of interpretation and they spent a goodly amount of time doing this and it got reduced to one sentence in their manuscript and they were just exasperated that something that took them so long to do was reduced to a single sentence. This is not terribly uncommon. So just because you spent a long time trying to do something doesn't mean it's gonna take up a lot of space in the manuscript. Uh, there's a, definitely a careful, delicate balance between having enough detail to replicate the experiment or whatever the research was and the space limitations. Now, this last point here is super important. And this is part of the more recent update that I did to this workshop. Check for updated reporting standards. What is that all about? Well, if you are used to publishing in journals that require you to follow APA guidelines, the American Psychological Association guidelines, you are accustomed to making sure that you have the current APA manual and following the guidance in there. What I'm talking about is different. The reporting standards for many things have started to change in recent years. For example, when I was trained, and I admit that was not recent, but when I was trained, we were told that you report um, statistical findings as either statistically significant or statistically not significant. And there was no need to provide an exact p-value, not that you really could because you had to go look it up in the back of a book and it was an approximate value anyhow. But as my statistics professor put it, exact p-values are less than trivial. He was known for that phrase. Exact p-values are less than trivial. Today, you have to provide the exact p-values. There is definitely a movement among lots of statisticians and the American Statistical Association, other organizations, about moving away from the phrase statistically significant or conversely statistically not significant. We will touch on that at a couple points later in the workshop, but that is a very recent change in the way things are reported. If you're writing up a meta-analysis, there are certain guidelines, the Cochrane guidelines that you would be following. They're updating those guidelines once maybe twice a year so every time i am either writing up a meta-analysis or helping someone write up a meta-analysis i've got to go back and look them over very carefully because they keep getting 
updated. And so what you have learned in school may or may not apply today. Uh, there's also been a lot of stuff if you're um, reporting stuff in the SEM literature and talking about causality, that has changed dramatically in the last few years, the way that these things get reported. And so this is a step that wasn't necessary only a few years ago and is now a critical step. So please be aware that reporting guidelines are changing on a lot of fronts. All right, I'm gonna pause here and ask for questions and then we will go on. If anybody would like to unmute themselves and ask me questions or if there are questions in the chat, would one of the consultants read them to me, please? It's so very quiet. I have a quick question about some of the examples that you gave regarding areas where dramatic changes have taken place. Yes. It would be really helpful if um, you could give examples or point us to some examples of um, like the best, best examples of the implementation of, of these new guidelines or papers that followed these new guidelines. If, if you can, if, if you have any for us. So for instance, like, we, can you think of a paper off the top of your head that does really well in following the new gui guidelines on um, SEM, st structural equation modeling, I guess, that's what it is. And discussions of causality, you know, like what are the best examples that come to mind? Um. I can't give you examples of papers per se, but if you're interested in the new stuff in this, um, you want to go look up the papers by Tyler Vanderweel. And I, one of the consultants will spell out his name in the chat for you, but he's written a series of very approachable papers on the current standards for publishing in this area. And you're gonna to wanna to have a look at his writing. Uh, a little later on, uh, I will uh, talk about the American Statistical Association and what their views and comments have been on this movement away from calling things statistically significant. So it's hard to give you examples of papers that do this, but what I can give you are resources that talk about what you should be doing. Uh, is that helpful? Yes, thank you. And yeah, uh, you did that better. So you answered that question better than I asked it. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So where to start? All right. The results section usually contains two parts, the descriptive statistics and the inferential statistics or the analyses. These two parts should be very, very closely related. So for example, you don't wanna describe all of the variables in your data set, especially those that are not gonna be used in the analysis. You only describe those that are gonna be used in the analyses. You don't wanna waste space. You don't wanna confuse your audience with stuff you're not going to use. And while this seems to be obvious, I can't tell you how many times I've read a manuscript and read about variables in the descriptives and never heard about the variables again. So this is an obvious thing, but it's a mistake that I actually see from time to time. So, you know, just kind of keep, keep your eye on that. Also make sure that all the variables that you use in the inferential statistics show up in the descriptives. So when I'm writing a paper, when I'm done with the inferential statistics, I have myself a list of all the variables that I have used. And I go back and I make sure that they are all in the descriptive section there just to make sure that I didn't miss anything. So what goes into the descriptive statistics? And I have to say, 
the section on descriptive statistics used to get very short shrift. It was one of those things that people did very mindlessly and hurried on to the inferential stuff because that's where they felt the action was. That's where they were testing their hypotheses and really getting answers to research questions. Nowadays, there's a lot more attention paid to the section on descriptive statistics. And there's two reasons for that. One reason is the rise in the popularity of meta-analyses. So meta-analyses take published papers and extract descriptive statistics or effect sizes out of these papers. And those are used as the data for the meta-analysis. So a lot of the effect sizes are actually based on the descriptive statistics, think Cohen's D or Hedges G or something like that. And so now all of a sudden the descriptives are seriously important. Moreover, one of the require, I don't know if it's really a requirement, but almost all of the good meta-analyses use quality checklists and they rate the studies used in the meta-analysis for the quality of the study so that they can control for it in a meta regression or do something else with the information. Well, the studies that have better descriptive statistics usually score higher. So if you want your paper to score higher on these kinds of things, better descriptives, more thorough descriptives should be um, included in your paper. Beyond that, almost everybody now is required to do an a priori um, power analysis. Well, looking through the literature for effect sizes, descriptive statistics is often very helpful when you're in the process of doing this power analysis. And, you know, much in the same way that you are super grateful when you find papers that give you the information you need to do this, future researchers will be very grateful to you if you provide them the information they need to do their um, power analysis. So in, in summary, what you really wanna do is make sure your descriptives are thorough. What should be included there? Um, let's see here, if you've got continuous variables, uh, continuous or ordinal uh, for the most part, they're handled the same way. You certainly want to provide the number of valid or non-missing values, means and standard deviations, perhaps the median, especially if it's very skewed. Definitely include the range. Uh, I always find it very frustrating when people say, oh yes, we use the scale of satisfaction and the mean was uh, 5.2 and the standard deviation was 1.6. That's great, but I have no sense of what those numbers mean if I don't know the range of the scale. Perhaps you should include correlations with other continuous variables without p-values, and I'll get back to this part about without p-values in just a second, and perhaps histograms. Usually this would only be for an outcome variable and only if space allows. For categorical variables, you definitely want to provide the frequency of each level, including the amount of missing data, perhaps cross tabs with other categorical variables, again, without p-values and perhaps bar charts. So what's this issue with nominal versus ordinal? Uh, well, what really matters is whether it's an outcome versus a predictor. If it's an outcome, how you handle nominal and ordinal variables is different because you're going to use a different kind of regression. If it's a predictor variable, then you choose, say, maybe it's going, you're going to treat the ordinal as categorical or continuous. But um, those are kind of the distinctions you make there. And what I typically find is that people provide more detail when it's an outcome than a predictor. For account variables, again, you usually provide much more uh, information if it's an outcome than if it's a predictor. Because if it's a predictor, you're just going to treat it as a continuous predictor, usually. But if it's an outcome, now you're more likely to be thinking in terms of some sort of count model like a Poisson or a negative binomial, and you'll want to provide more information about the distribution of the variable. 
Now, of course, all of this stuff is um, nearly suggestions. If you've got major grouping variables or you know, a grouping variable is your primary predictor, you might wish to provide the uh, number of cases, the means and standard deviations for each of those groups. Uh, we already talked about the meta-analysis stuff. But the use of p-values in this section should be avoided because descriptive statistics are just that. They describe your sample of the data. P-values necessarily mean that a hypothesis has been, uh, has been tested. But when you're describing data, there's no hypothesis being tested. So you shouldn't be giving p-values. Um, including p-values in the descriptive section also contributes to the alpha inflation problem. I have in here that we're going to discuss this later on in the workshop, and that is true. But since I mentioned it so many times during the workshop, let's just take a sneak peek ahead and go over what that alpha inflation problem really is. And I need to scroll down here. Um, important issue number three, alpha inflation and multiplicity. So alpha inflation is the unfortunate thing that happens when you conduct a large number of statistical significant tests on the same data set. So I'm gonna use an extreme example to illustrate your problem. Let's say that you only run one significance test on your data set and you have set your alpha equal to 0.05. This means that five times out of 100, if you ran this experiment 100 times, five of those times you're gonna get a statistically significant result when in fact that effect doesn't really exist in the real world, doesn't exist in the population. In other words, you've got a 5% chance of rejecting the null hypothesis when it's in fact true. Now let's say that you had that same data set and you ran 10 significance tests. Well, the formula for determining the alpha level here is one minus the quantity one minus alpha, in our case 0.05, raised to the x where x is the number of tests that you've run. So we set alpha at 0.05. So what we have here is the quantity one minus, this is 0.95, raised to the 10th, that equals 0.4. That means that you've got a 40% chance that you're going to get a type one error, not a 5% chance. That means that um, you know, your nominal alpha is no longer really 0.05, it's much higher at something like 0.4 and nobody's comfortable with that. So to address these problems, many researchers use some sort of alpha correction procedure or correction for multi multiplicity. It goes by a number of names, it's all the same thing. Um, these procedures can create their own set of problems, sadly. But the point here is that your first line of defense against running too many tests is to make sure that you don't run too many tests. And this goes back to that whole harping thing I was doing about planning. If you have planned out your hypotheses, what you're going to do, you've associated the tests with the hypotheses, you're not going to end up running a whole bunch of unnecessary tests. Now, um, one of my stats professors said that, you know, this is what you should do. You plan, you run those that you have planned, you go write it up or set it aside, and then you go snoop your data and you go try out things and you say, you know what, I'd be curious to see what happens if this and that. And for those kinds of things, you don't take the p-values so seriously. And maybe you're thinking about, you know, the next experiment and kind of the line of research you're doing or something like that. And so, yes, you're getting p-values, but you're not taking those so seriously, and you're less likely to report them. And so, uh, since you've done the important things first, it's kind of okay if you're snooping around your data looking for interesting things, and you're not taking the results super seriously, because they may or may not replicate in uh, future um, research.
uh, we'll come back to all the rest of this when I get to this section. So I'm going to scoot way back up here. Where were we? Uh, up to this um, and talk about inferential statistics. So in the analysis part of your results section, you describe your specific hypothesis, the statistical technique that you will be using and the actual model itself. In other words, the outcome and the predictor variables. Or if you're running something that doesn't have those, if you're just doing a test of association, what are the variables involved in the analysis? This is really important when your hypothesis involves an interaction. And a lot of hypotheses do involve interaction terms. You want to clearly state the relationship between the hypothesis and the statistical test. And this is important for a couple of reasons. It helps to guide your audience through this part of the section. It, and it will also make the connection between the substantive interpretation of the results easier. So if there's a clear connection between the hypothesis and the test, when you go to do the substantive interpretation, that part's going to be a whole lot easier. It's a good way to keep track of how many tests that you plan to run. You can try to minimize that. And you certainly, of course, order the tests from most important to least important. And it keeps you from uh, running tests just because. And I see that actually a lot in consulting. I'll ask people, well, why did you include this interaction term? I don't know. I thought I was supposed to. Okay, if your response to why is this term in the model, I don't know, you need to stop and go back and figure that part out. Um, the same thing with p-values in the um, descriptive section. I ask a number of clients, well, why do you have this here? What hypothesis are you testing? And they'll say, I didn't think I was testing a hypothesis, but you are. And so by planning all this stuff out, you avoid lots of other problems down the road. And yes, there are tests to correct for multiple comparisons, but they get more and more difficult to find anything statistically significant when you have more and more tests. And so you just kind of create this real big problem for yourself. So minimizing this is actually going to save you a lot of agony later on. For commonly used techniques, uh, I use OLS regression here as an example. Your description could be as short as a single sentence. This is to say you don't have to carry on for a whole paragraph about the description of this. For more complicated techniques, or if you're using something that is unfamiliar to your audience, more description and uh, explanation may be required. We had a client recently who came in and I had a need to use beta regression. And she said, boy, my audience probably has never heard of beta regression. And so she needed to not only explain what it was, but why she needed to use this as opposed to something more commonly used in the discipline. So um, think about what your audience is expecting, what you expect them to know with respect to statistics and adjust from there. You definitely want to describe the model building process. And this is one of the changes that uh, I noted earlier. You want to describe the predictor variables for the model and how they were selected. Did you select these based on theory, which of course is probably informed by the literature because these variables were statistically significant in intermediate models? Uh, were these statistically significant variables in bivariate analysis? Is there some other reason? You need to describe how they came to be there. The current prevailing thought is that theory should be the guiding force behind inclusion or exclusion of variables. Now, there are some practical matters that come in here. Uh, for example, we had a client who really wanted to include a certain predictor variable until we pointed out to uh, this individual that the variable was nearly a constant. 
and it, there's just no way to include it because a model wouldn't run with something in as a predictor that was so close to being a constant that just wasn't going to happen. So uh, another another instance is if you've got way too much missing data on a variable, you know, and you say, you know, oh my goodness, I'm going to lose 70 or 80 percent of my cases if I include this variable. Well, your theory may have wanted it to be in, but for practical reasons, may be left out. So theory is definitely your best guide, but there are practical considerations that have to be considered as well. Now, in times past, many researchers, and actually a lot of authors of very well-regarded statistical texts, in fact, many of them that are on the bookshelf right behind me, used intermediate models to work their way towards the final model. And so what they would do is a series of bivariate analyses, or they had a series of intermediate models, and the variables that ended up in the final model were variables that were statistically significant in these intermediate models. And the variables that were not statistically significant were not included in the final model. Well, if you listen to that description of what I just said, you might be thinking to yourself, you know, that kind of sounds like a kind of a manual version of a stepwise regression. And as you probably know, stepwise regression has fallen out of favor. And it's not just that it fell out of favor, it fell a long way out of favor and went splat on the ground. And over the years, more and more criticisms have been racked up against stepwise regression and all of its different incarnations. But for the um, point of this workshop, what you need to know is that those techniques tend to limit your generalizability. So those techniques capitalize on peculiarities in your current data set. And if you do that, those, those models don't generalize to other samples from the same population. And so you have a great fitting model with your sample and someone else tries that model in another sample and it fits terribly. And that is, you know, one of oh so many problems with these techniques. It also assumes a bunch of things that are probably not true. I won't get into all that unless you have questions about it, and then I can. But in other ways, avoid intermediate models when you can. And when you do use them, be upfront that you did this because your reader assumes that you have told them about all of the statistical tests you ran with the data, right? And so if you don't mention the 50 intermediate models that you ran, okay, well now that's gonna be a problem because I interpret those p-values a whole lot differently if I think you ran five tests and you really ran 50. So you do have to be honest about that. And again, go back to that planning. The way to avoid all those intermediate models is to plan very well. All right, let's see here, I bet I covered all of that. Uh, there are categorical variables in your model. Please very clearly state how they were handled. The reference category, the coding scheme specific hypothesis. I've got a whole section on this coming up, so I'm gonna wait till then to go over that. Most models make assumptions, and you should mention that these um, assumptions were assessed but I don't think you usually have to go into each of the diagnostic tests and details about that. Like I said, in a lot of cases, a single sentence will suffice, but you do want to include that sentence so the reader doesn't think that you just forgot about this. Most papers nowadays uh, mention what statistical package and which version of that package they use to conduct the analysis. Uh, order analyses from most to least important, except for when it's going to disrupt the flow of your story. That doesn't happen all that um, uh, all that often. All right, almost everybody has missing data in their data set. It's just one of those things with data, especially if you work with human beings in general. Humans are not terribly cooperative creatures, and you know, they, they give you messy data, missing data. Um, you know, that's why statisticians are, are employed because, you know, data are messy. You want to indicate how you're going to handle 
you're missing data. Did you do a listwise deletion? Did you do a complete case analysis? Did you do multiple? What'd you do? That's all you have to do is say what you did. If you did something like an MI or something, though, you'll probably have to give some description about that. Effect sizes have become super ultra popular. Most journals require the inclusion of effect sizes for all sorts of things. And you have to include the standard error of the effect size. Remember that an effect size is also an estimate from your data, just in the same way that coefficients are an estimate from your data. And so you've got to provide the standard error around that. Uh, let's see here. We went over reporting exact p-values. Um, now, some journals are actually discuss, uh, uh, discouraging folks from discussing terms of statistically significant or not statistically significant and put the emphasis instead on the effect size and how impactful an, an effect of that size would be in the real world. This requires a lot of thought, and I have to say is in many cases much more difficult. It's not that kind of mechanical, it's statistically significant, it's not. Uh, it's also moving away from the idea that what is important is statistically significant and what isn't important is not statistically significant. It's a, a move away from that idea. And while I very much support that idea, I have to say it has made writing that much more difficult. This advice in this area is still evolving. So check back, I don't know, every year or two, just to see what the current thought is. Uh, my favorite place to go for this is the American Statistical Association. I've got the URL for that right there on the web page. You don't have to be a member of ASA to get this information. It is freely available on their website. I should say that there isn't a heck of a lot of agreement among statisticians about the quote right way to handle this. There are lots of opinions out there, but there is general agreement that statistical tests have become far too important and their um, uh, prominence in research needs to be taken down a step or two. So keep that in mind. One thing that I find missing in a lot of papers is the test of the overall model. And, you know, kind of an odd thing to say after what I just said, but uh, when I've been working with researchers and I see uh, some of their output, it's like, wait a minute, the overall model isn't statistically significant. I'm not sure I'm all that interested in what else comes after that. So definitely check to see if the overall model was statistically significant before you go through the effort of interpreting the rest of the output. If you conducted an a priori power analysis, you'll want to describe it. And this will include uh, details about the assumptions that you made when running the power analysis, such as what effect size you were assuming and the justification for that assumption. That justification is actually another place where you'll see some change in the literature. Back when I was trained, we were told uh, Use pilot data. If you don't have pilot data for this, go to the literature. And if there's nothing there as a fallback, go based on um, arbitrary cutoffs for small, medium, and large effect sizes. Uh, today, the thinking is more along the lines of assume an effect size that is the smallest effect size that you would care about in the real world. Okay, so uh, I think it's fabulous advice, but for a lot of people, that's really a difficult number to come up with. So uh, I actually tried to, I still like pilot data, it gives me a lot of other information. I always suggest piloting any sort of research whenever you can, because it gets a lot of other bugs out. Uh, I agree with the criticism that the effect size from that could be very far off from the truth, absolutely, but um, sometimes I think it might be better than nothing. So 
uh, point is look to multiple places to get good ideas of what your effect sizes are uh, likely to be. If you are lucky, there will be at least a few days between the time you finish your writing and the time you have to submit the article. And you want a little time away from it so you can rewrite, reread it, proof it, um, catch errors, check for consistency, um, all sorts of stuff like that. If you have a, a willing colleague, uh, someone else reading it over is always a good idea. Uh, before I stop for questions and then move into examples, there's one more topic that I'd like to quickly mention, and that is the topic of measurement. Now, I have to agree with Andrew Gelman when he wrote, uh, for my money, the number one neglected topic in statistics is measurement. I have the link to his blog where he says this, including descriptions of how the variables were measured is always a good idea. Of course, that's one more thing to cover in a very short um, space. So I know that those are kind of conflicting things, but measurement is in many ways at the heart of a lot of the research that is done and it should not just be ignored out of hand. So uh, when you're thinking about, hey, what, what else is changing in statistics? I would suggest that a renewed focus on how things get measured is gonna be one of those areas where, where we start to see a change. All right, I am going to pause for a moment for questions and then we will move into examples. Any questions? Anybody wanna unmute themselves and ask questions? Are there any questions in the chat? Okay then, off we go again, another section. Okay, after I present, well, last time, pretty much every time I present this workshop, what I find, what we saw in this workshop is that people want specifics. What to say, what not to say, how to say it. They want to be shown some output, say of a regression analysis, and then an example of how to write that up. Unfortunately, this is practically impossible to do, and I'm going to show you why it's not a plausible thing to do in just a moment. Besides, this cookie cutter approach is always a bad way to go. I don't like people do statistics that way, and it's actually even worse when you try to write that way. Um, understanding what you're doing is the best way to write about it. Okay, the better you understand it, the easier and more clearly you will be able to write up your results. Another good strategy is to look at the texts in your field that report similar analyses. And uh, yeah, this is the section where I added in um, some of the references that you can use. So we've got some stuff on our website, our data analysis examples pages and our annotated output pages. Regression models for categorical and dependent variables using Stata third edition by Long and Fries is an excellent source if you are using any sort of categorical or count outcome, even if you're not using Stata, because they go over exact interpretations and things to look out for. Um, Another great book with lots of interpretation stuff is Introduction to Mediation, Moderation, and Conditional Process Analysis, the second edition by Andy Hayes. Um, he spends a lot of time not only interpreting the output, but showing you how to get from kind of the mechanical interpretation, you know, like for a one unit change in this predictor, the expected outcome changes by, you know, that's the mechanical um, version of this. He spends a lot of time trying to get you from that to a substantive interpretation using the example data sets that he has. And uh, you might be saying to yourself, well, I don't do mediation and I don't even know what conditional process is, but this moderation right here, those are interactions. All right. And interpreting interactions for the most part 
is probably the most difficult part of interpreting your output. So having a guide there, I think, is awesome. Michael Mitchell also has a book out, Interpreting and Visualizing Regression Models Using Stata. His second edition came out in 2020. All sorts of super excellent information regarding all the different types of coding schemes for categorical variables, the interpretation of all different kinds of coefficients and ways to visualize the results. Um, that's definitely more geared towards Stata users than other software. But again, I'm trying to just give you some places to go for concrete examples of interpreting things correctly. Now, in earlier versions of this workshop, I had said, you know, look up literature in your field. And I took that part out. <laughs> the reason I did was because I went to one of Michael Bornstein's free workshops was talking about the interpretation of I squared, which is a statistic used in meta-analysis. It doesn't matter what it is. But the important point was Michael Bornstein was saying, you know, I'm keeping a running collection of articles that misinterpret I squared. And he had approximately 100 published articles in his collection so far at that time with misinterpretations of I squared. I know of another researcher who keeps articles that have misinterpreted odds ratios and has a very hefty collection of such articles. And so I, I just urge a little bit of caution, you know, obviously looking at the literature for ideas about how you write about things, what the journal's expecting, all that, of course, absolutely. But there is a fair amount of misinterpretation of results out in the literature. And so I'm trying to give you some texts and some solid resources where you could go for some unequivocal um, examples of how to do it right. All right, all of that's done. Let's start off with some examples about why you can't just look at output and interpret it. So we see here on my screen here, we have a regression table. There is uh, two predictors in this model. There are two predictors in this model. One is called gender and one is called read. I will tell you that the variable gender is dichotomous and that the variable read is continuous. Okay. What could be difficult about this? Now, if you're reading ahead, okay, okay. But before you read ahead, what, what could be difficult? Could somebody unmute and tell me, how could that possibly be difficult to interpret? Anybody got any ideas what could come off the rails with this? All right, not a very talkative group. All right. We're not able to see the screen with the table. I'm sorry, what? We're not able to see the screen with the table. Uh, you don't see this table right here. My mouse is circling it right here. You don't see this? No. Oh, um, Andy, can you tell me what you guys see? What do I need to fix? There is no table. Yeah, we can't see. What do you see here? We see the web page. Okay, but you don't see SPS output that says coefficients? No, it's on inferential statistics right now. How can that possibly, uh, but I scrolled. Down. What? Are you maybe looking at it? Do you have two, two of these open? Nope, I only have one open and I only have one monitor. Um, Christine, you might need to turn it off and reshare. Yeah, uh, okay. frozen. All right, I have done that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Everything I see here looks all blurry, blurry. Select. OK, uh, it seems that this is more or less kind of crashed on me. Um, Andy, can you share your screen? Uh, sure, give me a second. 
Yeah, mine has pretty well crashed. Where am I stopping? Uh, it should be the first SPS output. It has a table of coefficients with gender and read. But okay. I can't see it. I don't see anything. I am sharing. I see absolutely nothing. I just see my screen. Maybe your Zoom is screwed up for right now. I'm pretty sure my Zoom is screwed up. OK. You want to take a moment to log out and log in or, or restart? Well, I started the meeting, so I'm afraid if I log out, I'm going to crash it for everybody. So we're just going to try and sync it. Um, I'll tell you when to scroll down. OK, so everybody sees a table of coefficients. It's got a constant. It's got gender. It's got read, right? We see that? Does everybody say yes? Because I guess yes. Yes. Yeah, great. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. What could possibly be difficult about interpreting that? Where 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 could something go wrong? Uh, I think the way gender might be coded. Yes. And I I tipped you off a little bit if you caught it when I said the variable gender is dichotomous. Yeah. Dichotomous technically means it's just got two values as opposed to the term binary which is more specific and means zero one if i say it's dichotomous now you don't know how i coded it if i coded it as zero and one then the intercept um, here is the um is one thing and if i code it as one, two, now the intercept means something different. And if I coded it one minus one, now the intercept is interpreted a third way, as is the uh, coefficient for gender. The other thing is the variable read. I told you it was continuous, but most people would just assume, oh, it's continuous in its original metric. But what if it had been centered? What if it had been standardized? Now, when I'm saying you need to be clear about your write-up, you're going to want to tell your reader, well, I coded, you used dummy coding, I used effect coding, I used, you know, whatever. There's actually about half a different uh, different coding schemes that you could use. And we actually have a series of web pages on that in our web book and the link is down uh, somewhere a little bit lower on the page. My point isn't to go through and interpret all these different ways. My point is that just looking at that table isn't going to be enough to tell you how to interpret the output because the variables could be coded in these different ways and telling you that one's dichotomous and one is continuous isn't doesn't give you sufficient information for uh, your purpose. So, uh, Andy, if you can scroll down a little bit to the next example here, where we have female read and the interaction term uh, fr. So, in this example, we've recoded gender. We've called it female and it is a binary variable. Um, one for female, zero for not female. In this example data set, that just means males, OK? But the point is, this variable is just a binary variable. And we're going to assume that the variable read is in its original metric. And then we've created the interaction term simply by multiplying the variable female with the variable read. OK. So if we look at our results, we see that the interaction term FR is not statistically significant. We see that the p-value is, in fact, 0.176. So how would you interpret this? 
a common question that we get is, well, if my interaction term isn't statistically significant, what should I do with it? Do I leave it in the model or do I take it out of the model? The answer to that question has a lot to do with the way you were trained. A lot of people were trained that if the model, if the interaction term isn't statistically significant, that you drop it out of the model. Other people say, well, you know, that was the test of my hypothesis, and I'm going to leave it in whether or not it is statistically significant, because the coefficients for female and read are still adjusted for that um, interaction term, even though it's not statistically significant. So how you handle this depends on your purpose. If this interaction term was something that you were really testing, or is it just something you were curious about and how you were trained. Um, other things to note, uh, when categorical predictors are coded one and minus one, one and minus one, the lower order terms in here are called main effects. When the categorical predictors are coded zero and one called dummy variables, dummy coding, then the lower order terms, those terms, not the interaction, the terms that made up that interaction, those are the lower order terms. Those are called simple effects. And this distinction is super important because main effects and simple effects are interpreted differently. And I see those terms, actually I see main effects very often in articles when they said they used zero one coding. And so it's super confusing for the reader. And um, I bring this to your attention just so that you don't add that confusion to your paper. So we have simple effects here. I'm not going over all the interpretation stuff. I'm just trying to get you the gotchas um, for these things and where, where to watch out. Um, choose the kind of coding system that gives you the interpretation that you would like to have. If you want the interpretation for main effects, then you can use one minus one. There's orthogonal um, things if you need that. Uh, there's Helmert and reverse Helmert. There's a bunch of others. And they give you different interpretations. You choose the one that gives you the interpretation you want and go with that. But I will say that the dummy coding is far and away the most common, all right? So um, that zero one kind of coding, and that means what you're seeing often is the simple effects, not main effects. Um, let's see here, uh, centering for continuous variables, if you want the intercept to uh, have a different meaning, then you can certainly center uh, your continuous variables. There's always questions about whether or not to center the uh, binary variables. Uh, that's a question for another day, but uh, just be aware that different people have very, very different opinions regarding that. One point I'd like to stress when talking about interactions in any kind of model is make a graph of it, make a picture of it. Most software nowadays will do that for you, although it's easier to do in some software packages than it is in others. Whether you're going to include that graph in your paper or not, it's going to make your life a whole lot easier to talk about because interpreting that coefficient of minus 1.34, excuse me, 0.134, yeah, that's great, but that doesn't really give you the picture in your mind telling you what's happening. So take the time to make the graph and uh, trust me, it is going to be worth it because it's gonna make writing about that interaction a whole lot easier. Uh, let's see here. So I hope I've convinced you that just looking at output is often not enough. Um, to go on when you're trying to do interpretation and writing and kind of the level of detail that you need to include when you're writing about variables. And although I used OLS regression in these examples, 
what I've told you applies to pretty much all kinds of regression models because all of the right hand side variables are handled pretty much the same way in all the different kinds of regressions, whether they're uh, logistic regression, ordinal logistic, multinomial logistic, multi-level modeling, name your poison, they're all kind of handled the same way. And so uh, what I've discussed here applies to all those different kinds of um, models. Oh, uh, another thing, another common mistake is the difference between multivariate regression and multiple regression. Uh, I catch this, I actually catch it among um, <clears throat> authors for whom uh, English may not be their first language um, more often, but to avoid the confusion, multivariate means that you have multiple outcomes. Multiple regression means that you have multiple predictors. And so you can have a multivariate multiple regression, but usually what people are talking about is a multiple regression, not a multivariate regression. All right, uh, I'm going to pause for questions before I move on to categorical variables. <clears throat> okay, I don't hear any questions. And honestly, my Zoom is pretty well crashed. Andy, can you unmute and just tell me that you still hear things? Uh, I'm still hearing, yeah. Okay. All right, uh, have you scrolled down to the part where it says example categorical predictor variables? Yes. Awesome sauce. Okay, so let's talk about those. Um, let's talk about categorical variables that have more than two uh, levels. In this example, I used a variable in our data set called race just because it was the variable in our data set that had four levels and that's what I wanted. You can assume that we use dummy coding here. And if you look at the output, you see um, towards the end of the output, it says race, and it has the numbers two, three, and four below it. And then you see we've got coefficients, their standard errors, the T, which is the test statistic, and then the P value. All right. And what you see is that it looks like one of the dummy variables is statistically significant and the other two are not. And my question to the audience is, what can we say about this? Okay, I don't hear anybody, so I'll go ahead and answer my own question. What you can say about this depends again on your training. So the way I was trained, the way I guess a lot of people were trained is your first order of business is to determine if the variable race in and of itself is statistically significant. That would be the omnibus or multi-degree of freedom test is statistically significant. And uh, I did this in Stata, so I used the test parm command. There's other commands I could have used, but it doesn't matter. And you can see that overall, this variable is not statistically significant. I've got a, a p-value here of 0.1757. So my training would say I would not consider the difference between level two and level one of race to be statistically significant regardless of its p-value. I just interpret that as potentially a false alarm. If you had a very specific hypothesis though, that there would be a difference between level two and level one, well, then you wouldn't need the overall test and you would just look at that one value. Honestly, I don't see that uh, so frequently in consulting or in the literature, but it is a legitimate thing to do as long as you said beforehand that's what you were going to do. So um, that's how you handle that. And that question actually comes up uh, fairly frequently. Uh, if we scroll down a little bit, we can see that I modified uh, the model a little bit, I changed out uh, some predictors, and now the 
overall test for this variable is statistically significant with a p-value of 0 0.0061. And now I am comfortable saying that level two of this variable is different from level one and level four is different from level one, but still level three is not because the difference between level three and level one it has a p-value of 0.884. Now, uh, the, I wrote this a while back, and we're not really here to do interpretation of stuff, but at this point, what I probably would do is get my predicted values for each of the levels of this variable and talk about those as opposed to getting overly obsessed with the p-values there. And if you have those predicted values, what you're going to see is that there are big differences between uh, groups one and two, one and four, but groups one and three, they probably have very similar predicted values. But my discussion would focus more on those predicted values. All right, let's scroll down some more. Um, Let's see here. Oh, one last uh, word of advice. If, say in that example there, level three was not statistically significant, do not just drop out that one level. I have seen people do that and it's very, very problematic. If you do that, all of a sudden your reference group becomes some combination of level one and level three. And that's probably not what you intended in substantively, that's probably gonna be very problematic. So if you have one level of a categorical variable that's not statistically significant, it still has to stay in there so that your reference group is what you intend it to be. Uh, we've got more information about these coding schemes in chapter five of our regression books. Um, for SAS data and SPSS. And so they will walk you through all the different kinds of options you have for handling the categorical variables. Oh, um, <laughs> one last thing. Definitely make sure that when you have a nominal variable, whether it's race or country or favorite flavor of ice cream, the uh, model of car you drive, whatever it is, um, make sure that you treat those nominal variables as categorical and not continuous. And if you have to report that omnibus test, that multi-degree of freedom test, you'll know you did it correctly. Uh, I've seen uh, at least one case uh, where a publication, you know, made it into the literature and unfortunately they had data from five countries. So they treat, they used a country as a predictor and then they treated it as linear, as continuous with like one degree of freedom. And somebody of course caught it and, you know, wrote in and said, hey, wait a minute, this is, this is wrong. You can't treat a nominal variables if it's continuous. And, you know, the authors of course were totally horrified and went back and when they corrected it, they lost all of their results and they, they had nothing, you know. And, you know, again, we're not focusing on statistical significance, but their whole story had to change because they had made that mistake. So if you have to report the omnibus test, it keeps you, it ensures you, you haven't uh, done that. Uh, let's see here. We're about halfway through. How about if we go ahead and take a break and uh, come back in, say, five minutes at, uh, it'll be 25 past the hour. Does that work for everybody? Yes. Yes. yes? OK, great. And in the meantime, uh, we will see if we can't do anything to fix this Zoom problem. Um, Andy, do you want me to try and quit Zoom or what do you want me to do? Yeah, uh, why don't you try leaving? You should be able to leave and make one of us post or you might want to make one of us post before you okay. leave. Uh, I can't at this point, I can't see anything other than the initial Zoom screen that tells me the time 
that the workshop is in progress. It says return to meeting. I, I don't see anything where I, I'm not at the place where I could make you a host. Okay, if you try to leave, will it, does it say end the meeting for all? Is that your only option? Uh, the only thing I can do is click on the X at the top. I don't even have leave meeting. Christina, if you click return meeting, what happens? Uh, absolutely nothing. <laughs> it be dead. I mean, it really be dead. All right, I'm I'm just gonna close it and try and come back. Okay. Oh no, I can't close it. Let's go into task manager. Let's see if we can get it out that way. Okay, it seems to be back. Uh, let's see here. I, I share my screen. Andy, can you see my screen now? Yes. Yeah. Aha! Okay, that is awesome sauce. Alrighty. All right, so uh, I will step away and I will be back in probably two minutes. All right, we're going to get started in about a minute. Uh, before we do, does anybody have any questions?
Uh, someone asked when you report your descriptives, do you prefer the standard deviation or the standard error? Um, typically when uh, reporting the uh, descriptives, I see standard deviation more than the standard error. So um, I hope that's useful. And for purposes of uh, doing a power analysis or a meta-analysis, you definitely want the standard deviation. Okay. All right, well, it's 25 past the hour. Let's rock and roll. We've got an example here on logistic regression. I'm gonna go through this uh, fairly quickly. Um, this is yet another example of interpreting output and you know what could go wrong with interpreting what looks like pretty straightforward output logistic regression is always difficult all right that that logit link that you have to use well you don't have to you could use probit uh, which isn't any better by way of interpretation but you got to do something to get that linear relationship between the outcome and the predictors and when you use the logit link, it comes with all sorts of headaches. Now, your output um, will come to you either with logits, which are log odds, those are the coefficients, or odds ratios, those are the ex exponentiated coefficients. After the fact, you can get predicted probabilities and you can, um, report your results uh, usually in the metric of logits or in the terms of odds ratios. And then by way of interpretation, you can go with logits, odds ratios, or predicted probabilities. The point I'm gonna make here is that there is no free lunch, okay? Each of these has its upsides and its downsides, and each of these are really easy to misinterpret. The upside to logits is that it's completely linear. And so it doesn't matter where you hold the other variables in the model, that coefficient is what the coefficient is. The obvious downside to logits, which are log odds, is that nobody actually knows what a unit increase in a log odd really is. You know, that doesn't map to something we know in the real world odds ratios are only slightly better in that you know they've now exponentiated this coefficient you can talk about um, factor change because now you're in a multiplicative kind of situation but the best comment i ever heard about odds ratios came from a faculty member from the school of medicine who claimed that odds ratio is the metric that we all use and no one understands and for the most part, I have to agree with, with that. So I really um, encourage people to look to textbooks for interpretation and help writing about odds ratios because you obviously don't want your paper added to somebody's collection of misinterpreted odds ratios. Predicted probabilities have the major upside of being a metric that we get. I understand that my predicted probability of having a one on an outcome is 0.1 or 0.9 or 0.5. I intuitively understand what those numbers mean. The problem is you are now in a nonlinear metric. And what that means is now it matters where you hold all of the other variables in the model. This is the so-called spotlight analysis. I, I love that term, it sounds so dramatic. It's a spotlight analysis. But really all that means is if you're gonna interpret your predicted probabilities, and I actually encourage people to do this because it's a metric that people understand, but you do have to be very explicit as to where all of the other covariates have been held because you change where they have been held and all of a sudden your predictive probabilities change as well. Um, so I've got a bunch of quotes from the Long and Freeze book. I have the second edition, so that's where my quotes come from, but the third edition is out. I, I don't know what they've added in the third edition, but uh, here are my quotes here. 
there are um, other cautions about um, odds ratios that I will quickly mention. One is to remember that, so you're exponentiating your coefficient. Well, if the coefficient's positive, then the odds ratio can go from one to infinity. But if the coefficient's negative, it gets bounded by zero and one. So you, you need to be kind of careful about that because of that compacting of the range for all of the negative uh, coefficients here. And I've got some uh, wording from the book here that I have uh, quoted um, regarding all of these different ways of writing about odds uh, logistic regression output. Um, interpreting the coefficients is challenging. It is far more challenging when you start having interactions in this model. So leave yourself plenty of time to figure out what that means and by all means graph it. You definitely need a picture. Do not try to just interpret that one coefficient, or maybe you have multiple coefficients if the uh, interaction term has multiple degrees of freedom. Interpreting a single number is going to be really tough. Get yourself a picture of what's going on so you can really understand that. Um, so, like I said, I wasn't going to uh, spend a lot of time on that one except for to urge uh, lots of caution uh, when you write about that and um, get, get yourself some good, reliable resources on that. The next um, example concerns confidence intervals. So I'm gonna jump ahead just a little bit because I gotta tie this back to the logistic regression. If you are in uh, reporting odds ratios, well, okay, let me step back. When you're interpret, if you're reporting your coefficients, the log odds, you would uh, report the um, coefficient itself, either the standard error or the confidence interval because they're mathematically related, you can get from one to the other, and then the test statistic and the p-value. When you're reporting odds ratios, you would report the odds ratio, the confidence interval, not the standard error, but the confidence interval, the test statistic, and the associated p-value. And I stress that because when you, uh, you exponentiate the coefficient, you also exponentiate the um, lower and upper bound of the confidence interval. And when you do that, you will find that your odds ratio is not centered in the middle of your confidence interval the way that your coefficients were. And that's why you don't report the um, standard error of the confidence interval, uh, excuse me, the standard error of the odds ratio, because um, you can't get to the confidence interval from the standard error when you're in that metric. All right, that was a little much and confidence intervals themselves are also quite confusing. Um, I personally do have a, a small collection of uh, famous goof ups in interpreting uh, confidence intervals. That's um, you know, one of the things that catches my attention. What does that confidence interval really tell you? I can tell you what it doesn't tell you. Do not say that we are 95% confident that the true parameter lies between the lower and upper bound. Do not say there's a 95% chance that the true parameter lies between the lower and upper bound. This is not true. You're in frequent statistics with this stuff and the interpretation of this is really awkward. What the confidence interval means is if you ran the experiment or research lots and lots of times, call it say 10,000 times, that range of the confidence interval would contain the true parameter 95% of the time. Okay, well, that's probably not the interpretation you were hoping for. You're probably hoping for something like, I'm 95% confident that the true parameter is in there. That's, that's not what you get in a frequency con confidence interval. For the most part though, you don't really need to comment on what those particular values are. They just are what they are. However, I will say that 
really large confidence intervals are sometimes indicative of a problem in the model. So even if your model converged and you know everything else seems to be fine, if the confidence interval seems to be crazy large, you probably need to go investigate that um, either there's a problem or at least you're going to have to explain it. And uh, just to give you a real life example, I was helping a um, medical student recently and his confidence intervals would range from something from like one to 5,000. And he said, well, dude, something's wrong. That's a red flag waving there. And some investigation showed that uh, that predictor variable was nearly a constant. That means that there's not a lot of information in the variable and hence the algorithm really had no idea where that poor point estimate was supposed to be. So it said it's somewhere between one and 5,000. And so I said, well, if you wanna keep that in the model, okay, but you're gonna to have to explain that extreme um, confidence interval. And so that's what he went ahead and did. Um, interaction terms. Uh, they're usually the most difficult thing to interpret. So get yourself a picture. It's really true. A picture is worth a thousand words here. Uh, there's all kinds of different interactions, but for all kinds of interactions, graphs are really the way to go. Another mistake to avoid is including the interaction term and then omitting one or more of the lower order terms. What do I mean by a lower order term? Let us say that we have a three-way interaction of X, Y, and Z. If you have that term, you need to have the interaction of X, Y, Y, Z, and X, Z, as well as X, Y, and Z. So for that three-way interaction, you necessarily have to have at least six other terms in the model. And again, these are terms that you would probably, well, you definitely have to report, but you probably don't have to interpret. You just have to uh, ensure that they're there. So um, more information can be found on our website at uh, these links here. Let's move on to, I believe, our last example, which is bivariate tests. So a bivariate test Literally, bivariate means two variables, literally a test with two variables. Well, stop and think about that for a minute. How many tests can you name that contain exactly two variables? Okay, well, let's see here. Chi-square, uh, Pearson correlation, simple OLS regression, simple logistic regression, a t-test, a one-way ANOVA, and there's probably a couple more that I haven't mentioned here. So the point is when you've done something like this, don't write it up by saying, hey, we did a bivariate test and the result was blah, blah. You need to say specifically, we ran a correlation between variable one and variable two and the result was, we ran a t-test between this continuous outcome and this binary predictor and the result was, Whatever it is, be more specific. But I do see the term bivariate test pop up, especially with people who feel very insecure about writing about the statistics. They think it's a very general term, and it most certainly is a very general term, but it is too general to give the reader a, a sufficient idea of what uh, statistical analyses you have done. All right. Um, one of my favorite parts of this talk here are the words of caution. And I have this list I've added to it over the years. I'll probably expand it again soon. And these are words I say, you know, be careful when you use these in your writing because many of these words have at least two meanings. There's the meaning in common parlance, and then there is a specific statistical meaning and sometimes more than one statistical meaning. And so you don't want to confuse your reader with uh, whether you mean this kind of in the common parlance or in the strict statistical sense of the word. Uh, the first example here though is words that for the most part should not show up in um, any write-up of anything proved or proven. 
it's right next to impossible, even when you're trying to talk about causality, to say that you have proved something. Um, you know, if you were doing statistical proofs, then uh, sure, you have, you have proved whatever it was you set out to do. But in most research, saying that you have proved or proven something is uh, just an inappropriate overreach. So kind of delete those words from your vocabulary. People like to talk about chance. There was a good chance that this or that happened or something. Well, again, it's got lots of meanings. You need to be very specific here. Odds, risk, um, there's all sorts of different um, ways that these words can be used, but they have precise meanings in statistics and you need to be careful about that. Same thing with probability. Well, when you talk about significance, you need to talk about statistical significance or do you mean real world statistic significance? Do, are you talking about a parameter? Are you talking about a model? You need to be very clear about uh, the significance. A likelihood, uh, definitely uh, one of those words that you don't use casually, it's got a specific meaning. Uh, beta, surprisingly, uh, there's, I find it surprising there's still debate over whether that refers to a standardized or an unstandardized regression coefficient, but uh, you do want to be specific when you use that term. Standardized, do you mean a standardized variable? Do you mean a standardized coefficient or do you mean standardized test scores or some combination thereof? Because you could actually have standardized test scores, then standardize the variable and have a standardized coefficient. You could do all three. I don't know why you would, but um, theoretically that's possible. Normal, well, um, very little is normal, but uh, be careful with using that word. Controlling for or adjusting for. Uh, these are terms that we get a lot of questions about in consulting and for example, we had, we had one client who came in and said, well, this is my predictor. These are the variables I'm controlling for, and these are the variables I'm adjusting for. Now in my output, how do I tell them apart? And it's like, whoa, hold on. To the statistical software, there's the outcome and there are the predictors. And the idea of your main predictor and the variables you're controlling for or adjusting for, that's something that is in the analyst's head to help the analyst. But mathematically, all predictors are handled the same way. And so in your writing, you don't want to make it seem like somehow they are treated in some sort of special way. Uh, controlling for and adjusting for are typically terms that are used interchangeably. They usually mean the same thing. Uh, covariance. All right, this is another term where you need to be quite careful. In classical ANOVA theory, which is taught to most of the psych students, a covariate is a continuous predictor. And if you use SPSS, the point and click interface, you will see that the dialog box where you put your continuous predictors is called covariates, right? Today, covariates generally means predictor variables not necessarily just continuous predictor variables. So if you're gonna use that term, um, try to be a little bit more specific. Robust, you can have robust regression, you can have robust standard errors, you can have robust findings. I think there was something in the chat about making sure that uh, models were, were robust to some assumption or another. But again, be careful that you are clear about whether you're talking about robust regression, which is a procedure itself, robust standard errors, there's a couple kinds of those, but there's robust standard errors and then uh, robust findings. Nested, you can have nested models, you can have nested data, you could have nested models with nested data. Um, the birds would be really happy about all that, I guess, but you need to be careful about what this nesting is. The same is true for hierarchical. You can have hierarchical models, you can have hierarchical data. If you have a hierarchical model, 
you need to be careful. Do you mean oh, like something like multi-level modeling or do you mean like blocked regression? And again, that goes back to kind of a psychology sort of a distinction there, but be careful with that term so that uh, you're communicating clearly. Random, there, there's all sorts of things that can be random. So you've got to be careful here. You can have random variables, random intercepts, random slopes, or more generally random effects. So be careful about what has gone random on you. Um, Datum is data R. So in, sometimes I see the word data used as a singular. Sometimes I see it used as a plural. What gets me the most is when I see it used both ways in the same article. And I actually reviewed an article once where they had used it both ways in the same sentence. And of course, I had to comment on that one. I think the right answer is data R, and that's what I see most commonly in the literature. Whatever you're going to do, pick it and stick with it. Don't oscillate back and forth. That will annoy your readers. It will annoy your reviewers. Pick one and stick with it. Strata. Strata means one thing in complex survey data. It means something different in survival analysis. And when you're doing survival analysis with complex survey data, you have to be extra careful when talking about straight up. Okay, like I said, I'll probably add to my list of words. And if you have any words that you feel should be in this list, go ahead and drop them in the chat. Let me know uh, what words of caution um, you, know, you think you need to be careful of. Tables and graphs. Okay, so Tables and graphs, very common in the published literature. Uh, also things that are starting to evolve, especially if you've got something where the paper is online, all of a sudden you can have color in your graphs or something like that. Um, but for the more traditional black and white published uh, papers, here is some of the uh, information for those. Now, uh, I have to say that I do often come across tables where I look at it and I say, gosh, I understand this and I don't understand that. It's not as common as I would like that I understand everything in various tables. So avoid the temptation to overwork your tables. And the reason people do that for the most part is because they've got space limitations. And so they're trying to save space by making these tables do lots of different things. Well, there's a, a quote in here that uh, tables multitask about as well as humans do. The simpler the task, the more you can multitask. So your table one with your descriptives may be able to multitask far better than your table with your coefficients or something like that. But tables are for communication, not just for storage, and they should have a purpose. They're supposed to contribute to your text. Um, they should be organized uh, so that it's easy for your audience to find things, understand things. Um, organization is critical. And what's in the tables shouldn't be duplicated, or at least not extensively, in the text. Those are some of the tips from one of the tables, or one of the tables, one of the books we have on um, uh, how to report uh, research findings. And that um, citation is right here, how to report statistics and medicine, an annotated guide for authors, editors, and reviewers. For creating graphs, uh, one of the books we have there is Displaying Your Findings, a practical guide for creating figures, posters, and presentations. Include only essential information. Um, but when they say no color, well, you know, that was then, this is now. Um, you should be able to understand it all on its own. You shouldn't have to read the surrounding stuff to understand what's in that um, graph. There are some other things in here, um, things that you know, I didn't realize that the y-axis should be two-thirds to three-quarters the length of the x-axis, but I guess that makes it more visually, um, visually appealing. Uh, 
uh, this is an important point here. Axis scales or the label should not be misleading. In other words, like a small difference should look small. And um, when you have graphs made by your software, oftentimes they'll expand, say, the y-axis to make the difference look big because they're trying to help you look at whatever. So you might have to modify that so that a small difference really does look small. Um, so here are some good tips on how to uh, make graphs more pleasant looking here. When you have large data, though, graphing is a whole nother kettle of fish. And there's a number of good books out recently talking about how to graph with particularly large data sets. Uh, one of the books we have is Graphics of Large Data Sets, Visualizing a Million. Uh, that's a 2006 book. There are uh, more recent books out there. But just be aware that when you have, you know, a lot of, of data points or a lot of lines to put on a graph, graphing it gets different when you have a lot. And you might want to look at some of these things to give you some ideas as to how to make that presentation. OK. Um, there are some things that I caution you to avoid. One of them is so-called false precision. So for example, if I have the mean of my variable, I report it as 3.2, not 3.2685310, or whatever my statistical software uh, said, you know, two digits is usually completely sufficient. Now that's for reporting, that's not um, what's being analyzed. Of course, the full precision is used for the analysis, but for reporting purposes, you usually don't want a whole lot of decimal points. Avoid calling one result, one result more significant than another, all right? Uh, this used to be a fairly common thing that we would see in uh, consulting. Oh, well, this, this result is more significant, so it must be more important. That is not true. And it goes back to what um, uh, my stats professor meant by the exact p-value is less than trivial. The fact that one p-value is 0.02 and the other is 0001 is usually not a particularly relevant fact. So don't don't use a p-value as a measure of importance there, all right? If you need to look for relative importance, which is actually fairly difficult to do in statistics, you want to look at effect sizes, but most certainly not at p-values. Do not claim that something is almost significant or nearly significant. That, that's another favorite thing, and because it's almost always the case that the variable you're most interested in has a p-value of 0.055, right? Oh, it's almost significant, all right? These are just different ways of saying not statistically significant. Also try to avoid adjusting your model to get the p-value that you want. P-hacking um, was never a good idea, but it's really under a spotlight now and that, that's really something to avoid. While we're on the topic of non-significant results, a good way to save space in your paper is to not spend a bunch of time speculating why something isn't statistically significant. Now, you might say, you know, uh, we have a lot of missing data on this value and future research may want to address that. OK, that's fine. But if a predictor isn't statistically significant, because of the nature of statistical tests, you don't really know why the result is not statistically significant, you know, and so you, you don't want to waste valuable space speculating there. It's not statistically significant. Go ahead and move on, right? Talk about other things that are important. Of course, definitely report the effect size, right? You report the effect size regardless of statistical significance, and you may say, hey, look, it's not statistically significant, but I still care about an effect size of this value then you proceed on with whatever you're going to do. But don't stop and worry about why something isn't statistically significant. Um, while we're on that topic, 
by all means, avoid post hoc power analyses, okay? That's not only a waste of space, it's a waste of your time. Uh, two of my favorite articles on this are um, the abuse of power, the pervasive fallacy of power calculations for data analysis and post hoc power analysis, an idea whose time has passed. Um, these authors show that the um, uh, power is mathematically related to the p-value. So once you have the p-value, there's nothing else to be gained here. And as uh, Levine and Ensom clearly explained, the logic underlying post hoc power analyses is fundamentally flawed. So don't waste your time there, okay? Um, if it's not statistically significant, that's fine. Just move on and... Um, Let's see here, what else? Oh, the changing thinking regarding p-values. Okay, we've covered this a little bit. There's only a few folks who really suggest doing away with p-values. And I think there is actually one journal out there that won't let you report p-values. Um, but most statisticians at this point just suggest downgrading the importance of p-values. There's a number of... Um, journals, actually even some um, restricted data sets that say you can't use the term statistically significant or statistically non-significant and instead replace those things with a discussion of whether or not the effects that you're observing are important in the real world. Okay. Um, that is way easier said than done. Okay. Um, I understand that that whole mechanistic way of determining what was important and what wasn't is seriously flawed, but it is really, really much more difficult to talk about, you know, when an effect size is important in the real world for, versus when it isn't. So my silly example here is that, you know, if you found a correlation of 0.9, that's probably an important correlation. And if you find a correlation of 0 0.001, that's probably not an important um, finding in the real world. But there's a lot of values in between those two. And it's often difficult to say at what point that you start caring about the level of the correlation. And my other thing about this is that all of the examples that I've seen have been in the most simplistic of settings, whether it's a correlation or a t-test and I rarely see anybody generalize beyond that but in all honesty almost everybody does statistical testing that's far more sophisticated than a t-test or a correlation and so I'm eager to see how this develops uh, so that there's a little more solid advice as to how to proceed here. Um, effect sizes you definitely want to report them again you have to report their standard error but the hiccup with that is that effect sizes haven't been developed for all models. So for example, if you have a count model, there is no agreed upon um, effect size for that. Some people exponentiate the coefficient and try and use that, but it is not widely agreed upon in the literature there. Um, for a linear multi-level model, there are several um, uh, things that have been proposed in the literature. But the problem is, is if you go calculate your effect size in these different ways, they're not always congruous. And so when you do something like that, you definitely want to say, hey, look, I calculated this effect size pursuant to you know, whichever author you're following there so that um, your reader at least knows what kind of effect size you have. Um, have calculated. And for those that you have to do by hand, um, it's often a little more difficult to find the formula to calculate the uh, standard error. And at that point, you really do come to appreciate your software where most things are calculated for you because calculating standard errors is usually kind of time consuming. All right, uh, let's talk about some other important issues. First and foremost is missing data. Uh, the best kind of missing data is no missing data. 
right? My friend Larry always says this, don't want missing data there. Handling missing data can take a lot of time. This is another area where you can easily spend months and months of work, especially if you've got to do a multiple imputation and it will take, you know, maybe a small paragraph in your paper. And it can be very frustrating to put in so much effort there. I mean, it's time well spent, you have to do it, but it doesn't get a lot of real estate in the paper. Um, this is also part of the planning. So when you're planning, you want to decide what you're going to do about missing data. Now, I've seen a lot of people say, look, I'm going to do this if we have, you know, if we have less than 5% missing, we're just gonna go with the list-wise deletion. And if we have between this and this, we're gonna consider multiple imputation and um, you know, maybe we're gonna do something else. Um, and maybe you don't do the same thing for all of the variables in the data set. Planning, 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 especially if you're gonna do multiple imputation because um, in multiple imputation, you have the imputation model and the analysis model, and you need good auxiliary variables for that imputation model. Well, if you hadn't thought about doing multiple imputation when you were planning the study, you might not have known to collect the data for those auxiliary variables that you need in order to have a good imputation equation. So again, planning is super critical here. Um, how, how are you gonna handle that? and um, just, just make sure you know what you're gonna do. Small sample sizes. All right, big data come with their own problems, small samples, will they come with their own set of problems too? You know, I kind of feel like, you know, baby bear, he, he's got his issues, papa bear, he's got his issues. You want kind of mama bear's porridge, man. You want the stuff in the middle, it's just right. So what's up with the small samples? They can be problems for a lot of reasons. Of course, your very first question to me is, well, what do you mean by small? And I can't really answer that, uh, nor can I tell you, well, is my sample size sufficient? I've seen tons of rules of thumb in the literature, and for the most part, I don't like any of them. But small has the following problems. So these are the problems you want to avoid. And so this is how I kind of decide if something is too small. If the sample is so small that there's really no way you could consider it to be a representative sample of your population. So for example, if I am thinking about uh, the student body at UCLA as my population, I guarantee you sampling five people is insufficient, it's too small. I can't cover the variability of my population with an N of five. So think about that. Um, at a bare minimum, you need to think about degrees of freedom and running out of degrees of freedom because that's, um, you know, that's another problem that will hit. Some, analyses just tend not to play well with small sample sizes. For example, maximum likelihood, uh, Pearson correlations, EFA, because it's typically based on um, a Pearson correlation. And for that matter, if you're talking tetrachoric or polychoric correlations, well, small sample sizes don't definitely don't work with those kinds of things. When you talk about, say, logistic regression, it's not necessarily just the sample size that matters, but the distribution of your outcome. So let us say, for example, that you have 100 cases. Well, if I have 100 cases and my outcome variable has 50% zeros and 50% ones, that's a very different situation than when I have 100 cases and I have 97 zeros and three ones. So sometimes it's not just the sample size that you have to be worried about. Um, other problems that can happen, uh, the model may not converge. It could hit all sorts of numeric problems. Your um, matrix may not be positive definite. Uh, your model could be uh, very fragile. 
meaning if you put in a predictor, the model won't converge, or if you take a predictor out, the model won't converge. Um, meeting some of the assumptions of the tests can be uh, much more difficult in smaller uh, sample sizes. And all of this can lead to the awkward situation where you have to fall back to something else. Let's say that, for example, you wanted to do a logistic regression and you had some problems. Well, one of the fallback positions might be a series of chi-squared tests. Well, those come with their own problems. You know, all of a sudden you have four chi-squares instead of one logistic regression. Uh, it really gets to be a bit of a nightmare. So again, go back to planning, make sure you're going to have um, enough rows with complete data or at least complete data on the variables that you really need so that you can get yourself out of some of these problems. We talked about alpha inflation and um, multiplicity. The uh, ways to address this, um, the alpha um, corrections or multiplicity uh, tests, there's dozens of them. And one very common question is, well, which one do I use? Uh, really, it depends on how conservative or how liberal you want to be. And that is driven by, to your mind, what is the greater problem, committing a type one error or a type two error? And that is something that you as the researcher uh, need to address. So far, I haven't seen a lot of reviewers get really specific about which multiple comparison uh, correction you use, so long as you used one of them. However, I will say that I have seen some reviewers who are kind of confused about some of the newer ones, so that might require a little bit of explanation. Uh, one other problem here that I just bring your attention to, we had talked previously about not running a whole bunch of tests. And if you combine that idea with a small sample size, imagine what happens. Let us say you have an N of 20, it's a small sample size. You could actually run say 25 chi-squares on that N of uh, 20. But what you've done is gotten into a problem that uh, Frank Harrell Jr. discusses in his book, uh, Regression Modeling Strategies. The second edition is, was in 2015. And he calls this the phantom degrees of freedom problem. In other words, you've actually run more tests than you had subjects. Now, mechanically, it works. Logically, it is seriously flawed. And he's got a nice discussion of this issue of the phantom degrees of freedom. And yes, they are definitely as spooky as they sound. All right, uh, two other th uh, things to be careful about, complex survey data. Uh, one of my favorite areas of statistics, and I will tell you that a lot of researchers who have never used these types of data before believe that analyzing um, complex survey data is just like analyzing data from experiments or quasi-experiments, and this just isn't true. There's other complexities that you have to take into account. Oftentimes, uh, I get asked for statistics with complex survey uh, data analysis that have not been developed yet. Uh, there's some graphical methods that have not yet been developed. There's um, work going on to help assess model assumptions, but that work is very much in process. So definitely do not just assume that when you're using complex survey data, and by this I mean the big public use data sets, whether it's the American Community Survey, and Haynes, uh, CHIS, LA fans, whatever it is, just be aware that there are some real differences between the unweighted and the weighted data. Now, technically, almost all complex survey data are actually correlated data, but there are lots of correlated data that are not complex survey data, and those are the so-called nested data sets. And there's all sorts of different ways that data sets can be nested. Uh, some of them are very straightforward. Some of them are cross-classified or imperfect hierarchies. It can be 
a real mess here. Some examples, patients or doctors nested in hospitals, uh, people nested in neighborhoods, partners nested in uh, couples, children nested in families. There's lots of ways to handle these, but again, you want to plan. Are you thinking multi-level model here? Are you thinking single level model with cluster robust standard errors? Are you thinking GEE? There's all these different things that you could be thinking. Make sure that you have done your planning uh, very well. And if you're not familiar with some of these techniques, go grab some example data sets and play around. Find out if the results are robust across some of these different um, methodologies and think about, well, what would readers in my area expect to see. All right, uh, use of the web. So uh, they've been threatening for a long time to um, have researchers make their data sets, real or synthetic data, code books and syntax available on the publisher's website. I haven't actually seen a lot of folks do this, but uh, I've heard this bounce around for a long time. What was new here, um, you know, we just heard about it at the last joint statistical meetings, which was earlier this month, was that um, when they make the data sets available, they would not allow folks to post their real data. They would have to create a synthetic data set. And if this is a completely new topic and you've never heard of this before, I'm sure you will be hearing more about it in the future. But my point is that this could be an additional uh, complexity for you. I always encourage people to uh, capture their syntax, whether you write it, whether you point and click and then uh, capture the code after the fact. However it is, keep a written record of everything that you've done, all of your data management, all of your analyses, and in fact, in most of the big um, general use uh, software packages now, so SAS data, even SPSS, you can write a single file that writes out the entire article, does the analyses, makes the graphs, generates the tables, and it's all in a single document. If that's something of interest to you, <laughs> plan for that because in none of the software um, is any of that super simple or super straightforward. I mean, once you get the hang of it, then you can move through it pretty quickly, but there is definitely a learning curve there. The upside to that though, is that it's easy to make a change, whether you add a predictor, you take a predictor out, all of a sudden, oh, I need to add one more decimal place, I need to take off one more decimal place, and you can make a simple change and rerun it, and it all gets done automatically. You never have that terrible worry about, you know, did I copy this from the output into the table correctly? Um, those kinds of things are alleviated, but there is the additional work of making these files. Uh, let's see here. Um, the last thing I would say is keep yourself organized, keep the data and the syntax and all the stuff together in some accessible um, format or something. And I say this because, like I said, meta analyses are becoming more common and therefore requests for descriptive statistics that were not included in the original paper are becoming more common. And uh, uh, the first meta-analysis paper that I was on, we sent out, I don't know, three or four requests for um, some additional um, descriptive statistics. And <laughs> one researcher wrote back and she said, well, they're on tapes like tape reels. So if you can read my tape reels, please go ahead and can I have a copy of my data when you're done? And um, we might actually have been able to read the tape reel, but the problem is tape doesn't age well and it tends to fall apart when you try to read it. So um, definitely though, 
keep in mind that it's a higher probability that you're going to be asked for more descriptive statistics, asked about something that you have published. So keep everything together and accessible for yourself. Okay. I have some additional resources uh, listed here. They're all stuff off of our website. Um, and now it's the time for our exercises in statistical writing. I hope, please, please work. Ha, it works. I hope you can see that. Okay, so I have six descriptions. This is where you actually, please unmute yourselves. And let's have a conversation about these. So let's start with the first one. How many tests do you need to run on a single data set when your nominal alpha is set to 0.05 to have a 50% chance that at least one or more of your tests is statistically significant by chance alone? AKA, at what point do you have a 50% chance of having a false alarm. Think about that uh, little formula I showed you in the thing and figure out how many tests do you have to run? How many p-values do you have to rack up before you're talking about a 50% chance of a false alarm? Go ahead and unmute and tell me what number you come up with. While you're thinking about that one, I will say this is where I really miss having the in-person workshops because this is where I walk around with my bag of, of candy and offer candy treats to, to the people who respond or the people who respond first. And so I'm sorry, I can't <laughs> motivate you with, you know, pick me up candy. Um, it, well, it's afternoon for me here. So for me, it's kind of a pick me up a little refresher in the afternoon, but um, I'm sorry, I can't hand out candy to those of you who respond, but anybody got an idea for me? How many tests do you have to run before you get to that 50% chance? If you said something I can't hear you, could you please speak up? There is some answer on the chat. Andy, is there an answer in the chat? Yes, yeah, somebody guessed 14. Yeah, 13 to 14 is the right answer. It's right in that range, right there. So Think about the last time you analyzed data and how easy it was to come up with that many p-values. I mean, I know, you know, my goodness, you know, I've, I've got lots of regressions where I generate more p-values in my regression than that. So yeah, it is really easy to get past that nominal 0.05, okay? All right, thank you. Let's move on to question two. Try and improve this description. What would you do to improve this? We ran bivariate analyses between outcome and predictors. Only two tests were statistically significant at the alpha equal 0.05 level. These predictors were retained for our final model. How can I improve that? State which bivariate tests were actually run. Yes, that's, that's the first thing I'd do. What else would I do? I would probably want a list of predictors so I knew how many tests got run, right? Mm -hmm. If I've got three predictors, 
and two are statistically significant, that's really very different than if I have 20 predictors and two are statistically significant. Do you see why I would take those results differently in those two different situations? And then of course, retaining these predictors for our final model, now you're letting your data dictate your model. And that's usually not a good idea, okay? If there's something strange about your sample, and there usually is, okay? Getting a truly representative sample is really, really, really difficult. And so you are resting on the assumption that your sample of data are, is representative of the whole population. And I think that's uh, true much less of the time than we would like to think. So letting your data determine your model is fraught with all sorts of dangers. One of the most significant dangers, significant, gotta watch the use of that word, Right. One of the uh, big potential problems there is your ability to generalize your results. OK, does anyone have any other comments they'd like to make on question two before we move on? Christine, are you sharing something on the web page? Uh, no, I am sharing a Word document. I clicked on the Word document. Do you not we see We do my not Word see document? the Word document, no. No. And it says I'm sharing. I see it. Oh, good. All right, if you don't see the Word document, please scroll down to the very bottom of the web page, and there's a link there for it. And it, it says exercises for statistical writing workshop. Click on that, and it should open a Word document for you, OK? OK. All right. Let's move on to number three. Let's try to improve this description. We ran OLS regression using the variables in table one as predictors. Well, we need to see table one. <laughs> Um, it's so generic. Wouldn't you just want to say what the actual predictors were instead of having them look at a table? Yes, that that's exactly where I was going with this. You don't want to have to flip the page to table one. And you're right, it's too generic. How do I know which ones are continuous or categorical? How are categoricals are um, coded? The, there's not enough information here. All right. They were trying to minimize the number of words and kind of did that a little too much. Okay, but you're right, it, it's too generic. Awesome. Okay, number four. Here's another um, improve the description. We conducted a series of simple logistic regressions. When the predictor X was used, we adjusted for the variable Z as a cluster. It's a little bit confusing, like for which particular regressions did the cluster adjustment happen? Right. Well, the way I read it, and I actually hijacked this from a published article. Okay. I mean, I, I changed some of the wording so that, you know, you can't really see which article it came from, but I actually did read this in an article. Um, my problem is, so if you do a bunch of simple logistic regressions, and that's okay because their point was to get odds ratios and that's how they were getting odds ratios. And, and that was okay, I understood that. But why would you only adjust for a cluster variable when you had this particular predictor and not anything else? If your data are clustered, you have to take that into account for all of your models, not just when you use one predictor. And my other criticism is, well, what do you mean by adjust here? Are you saying that you put Z in as a predictor? Do you mean you use cluster robust standard errors? I don't actually know 
what you did here. So I find this confusing on a number of levels. But like I said, I've actually seen this like in the literature and I, like, how did that get passed to review or why didn't someone say, hey, wait a minute, what do you mean by this? So when I say be specific about what you did, I mean, be really specific. We used variable Z as a predictor in the model. We obtained cluster robust standard errors by using Z as the cluster variable. Whatever it was you did, state it. Right, but this is ambiguous. All right, number five. Uh, also, something I read in the literature. Okay, and this one's an, an exact quote, but I'm sure it's pretty hard to find. We made the normal assumption regarding our linear regression. Any comments? How would you improve that? Hi, Christine. I just realized I don't see your Word document. Okay. Um, if you don't see my Word document, um, on are, are you on our web page? Yeah. Web page with all the notes. Scroll all the way to the very bottom, and you should see um, a link there that says um, exercises for statistical writing workshop. Yeah, I found it. Okay. So Click are on that you? And that should you, open up the Word document. Okay. I found it. Thank you. Okay, sure. All right. We made the normal assumption regarding our linear regression. Okay, let's take a step back. What does that actually mean? A reference to normally distributed variables. Good. Is there an S missing on assumptions? Did they mean to say we made the normal assumptions regarding our linear regression? Is normal the problem? Do they mean to say we made the normality assumption regarding our linear regression? I don't even know what they're trying to say here. Okay, so when I say be specific about what you mean, this is what I'm talking about. And when I said, take a couple of days to step away from the article and go back and reread it with fresh eyes, this is why. Because I could see writing this, you know, especially when you're pulling an all nighter or, you know, you're on your 10th cup of espresso or something, I can see somebody writing this. But when you go back and read it, it should catch your attention that that is ambiguous. That doesn't tell the reader what you're intending to convey. Does that make sense to folks? Yep. OK. Uh, here's the last one. Now, I don't I see that actually I, I saw this in a book I reviewed. Um, and I've also seen it a lot in consulting because a lot of people come in saying, I have to find out which variables are the most important. All right, so that's where this comes from here. Predictor C is statistically significant, P equal 0 0.015. Predictor D is also statistically significant, P equal 0 0.0001. And predictor E is not statistically significant, P equal 0 0.055. We therefore conclude that predictor D is the most important predictor in our model and that predictor E is the least important predictor. Future research should focus mostly on predictor B, somewhat on predictor C, and ignore predictor E. All right, who wants to who wants to comment on this? I mean, that was something you mentioned earlier. Yes. In 
And it seems to me a better way to go about it is maybe it's probably discipline specific, but better to just discuss this maybe in terms of theories, like make it theory driven. You know, what makes a predictor more or less salient in your field, given the topic and given the lid? Um, all sounds very vague. I can't think of an example right now, but. Okay, I think you're on the right track. What I would want to see here is instead of those p values, I'd want to see effect sizes. If you have to go kind of towards the uh, way of what is most important or somehow least important, you want to be thinking in terms of effect sizes for that kind of thing, not p values. The exact p value doesn't tell you anything about importance, right? Remember, we don't want to call one statistically significant predictor more important than another simply because it's got a smaller p-value, right? P-values don't tell you about importance. Um, to the extent that you can talk about importance, that's more in terms of effect sizes, but it's most certainly not um, uh, p-values. Okay, that, that p-values aren't going to give you that kind of information. So here I'd want to be thinking about effect sizes. All right, so we have about a half an hour left. And what I thought I would do for the last half hour is talk to folks about their quandaries when writing up results, statistical analyses, and how to present those results to their audiences. So if you have specific questions, hopefully they're not so specific that they're not of interest to anybody else. But if you've got questions, you know, from your own experience and your own struggles, then uh, now would be the time to ask about that. And I am going to see if I can Oh boy, it is kind of crashed again on mine. Uh, I'm not quite sure how to stop my share. Uh, okay, um, mine has crashed again. Uh, Andy, what do you see on Stop your screen? Stop sharing. I've stopped sharing. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Um, I actually can't see anything at all, and I can't even minimize the Zoom meeting. Uh, so I've crashed again. So I'll tell you what, um, I don't need to be able to see you to answer questions. Who would like to ask about their own writing adventures? Uh, I have a question. Yes. So in the day I've worked with, with you, I don't get a statistically significant result. I actually don't want a statistically significant result. But if you were talking about p-value, to say it's not significant seems a little bit different than saying it is significant. In other words, if I'm if I, if I was trying for significance, I'd be you know glad it was less than 0.05. But if I really am glad if it's not significant, do I go by that same standard? Do I have to do like, you know, less than I'm using the less than just sort of not properly, but to, to sort of tell you what I mean, do I need to say, well, if it's less than 0.1 or something? Okay, so here's the trick. <clears throat> the null hypothesis testing is used to determine if something is different from something else. But if it's not statistically significant, now I don't know why and I can't say that, you know, the uh, say the control and experimental groups are the same. I cannot conclude that if I fail to reject my null hypothesis 
because I can't say why I failed to reject. Now, if you're trying to say that my control and experimental groups are equivalent, then there are tests of equivalence, and those can be used to make that statement. Um, but the reason it's really dangerous to say, well, they're not statistically significantly different, and that's what we were hoping for, is that if you just increase your sample size enough, your non-significant result will go statistically significant. And that's another reason why people kind of shying away from p-values, especially in the era of big data. Because once you have, um, say, 100,000 observations in your data set, p-values become meaningless because everything is statistically significant. And so it's not really helpful. It doesn't tell you anything at all. Not that you know p-values are all that great. But at this point, they've become downright meaningless because everything is statistically significant. In small data, you have exactly the opposite problem. Nothing is statistically significant because you don't have the power to detect the effect, even if the effect is really, really big. So I would be very careful when you want to talk about non-significant results for both the reason because if you just increase the N enough, I promise you it will become statistically significant. And even in your sample, you can't say why that non-significance is there. There's all sorts of different reasons the results could be non-significant and you can't choose among them. Does that make sense? Yes, but what about looking at effect size? So um... effect size is a great way to go. Okay. So um, the kind of effect size that you use depends on the kind of analysis that you're uh, in. You know, if you're in OLS regression, you can have an omega squared or something like that. Uh, that's another point I should make real quick. Sometimes the effect sizes are labeled differently in the different software packages. And I find that to be completely confusing and frustrating. So uh, SPSS is notorious for the way they label things. Um, and they're they think they call it an adjusted omega squared is really the same thing as the omega squared that you get out of Stata and SAS. I forget how it works, but anyhow, it's the same value labeled differently and that was a huge source of confusion. But anyway, you want to look at your effect size. And before you do that, ask yourself, how big of an effect size would I care about? All right, so you would need to know kind of what the range of possibilities are and then ask yourself, well, you know, are there kind of standards, rough and ready measures like there are in a Cohen's D? Not that you should really live by those, but there are some standards out there that, you know, you can say, you know, uh, an effect size of 0.9 on a Cohen's D metric, that's a big effect, right? And so you know, you, you would want to know that's really kind of the way the scale works there, but find out what your scale is and find out, well, how, how big of an effect size would I care about? Would I care about a small one? Would I care about a medium one? You know, and then you can get more specific. I think that's the way I would go with what you're doing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Christine. Yes, hello. Um, I just want to ask when I'm uh, analyzing like Likert scale questions. Yes. Should I use the mean or the median when I do my descriptive statistics? I would say that depends on how skewed they are. Now, you're always safest reporting both if you have the space to do so, because everybody will realize that if the mean and median are close together, that you've got something that's normally distributed and the further apart they get, the more skewed your distribution is. So in the ideal world, I would like to report both of them. But if for some reason I can only report one, it would probably have to do with how skewed the, um, the variable is. Does that help? 
yes, 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 it, it does help. So it doesn't matter even if it's, it's, it's a five point liquid scale or a seven point liquid scale. Uh, that's correct because either of those can be approximately normally distributed. Either of those could be very skewed. You know, you could have a pile up of observations with very low values or um, most of your observations with very high values. And it doesn't matter how many points are on the scale, whether it's three, five, seven, ten, 10, uh, whatever. So now if it gets down to something like three, even if you're going to treat it as continuous, I have seen people report both the mean and then a breakdown of um, the number of uh, responses for each of those levels, especially if one category didn't get used a whole lot. Uh, thank you very much. That was helpful. Oh, good. All right. What other questions? Hi, Christine. Uh, okay. So as a follow-up question for the, uh, on the previous one, uh, you mentioned that you can report the mean or median. If you don't have space to report both, you can report one of them based on how skewed is your variable. Sometimes you have a table, you wanna report like three, four, five variables, uh, descriptive values of these variables in the same table. And sometimes some of them are skewed and others are not. So which one to is preferred in this case? Should I report mean for all of them or median for all of them? You're correct that you're gonna to have to choose. If they're, some are normally distributed and some are skewed, I would try to find a way either to put in the mean and median or at least the mean and the standard deviation to give the audience some sense of what the variable really looks like and how it's distributed, because that's really what you're trying to convey. Um, but you're right, you don't get to pick and choose when you're making a table. Uh, you can't report the median for some and the mean for others in the same table. That usually doesn't work out so well. Um, but I have seen people, you know, put various things in parentheses or do something like that to try to convey that information. Uh, it's probably more important with respect to the outcome than the predictors. And I say that not because there's any assumption regarding the um, distribution of your outcome, because there is not. That's a common misconception. There is no assumption regarding the distribution of the outcome. On the other hand, I always look at that because it gives me a little bit of insight as to how my regression diagnostics might go. The assumption of normality is with respect to the residuals for the model, not the outcome. Of course, those are related. So, you know, if you've got a terribly skewed outcome, you're likely to have terribly skewed residuals. But for the most part, I don't really care about that because normality of my residuals is kind of the least of my concerns. Where I get worried is in my assumption of homogeneity of variance. And so I want to make sure that I don't violate that one, or at least not violate it grossly, because if I screw that assumption up, I probably messed up my standard errors. And since your point estimate divided by its standard error is usually your test statistic, you don't want that denominator grossly um, miscalculated. So when I'm looking at distributions of variables, I'm far more concerned about my um, continuous outcomes and how they're going to play with my regression assumptions. And if that um, outcome is terribly skewed, I'm gonna pay really close attention to my tests or my graphs regarding a homogeneity of variance. Yeah, that's very informative. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have any other questions? Hi, Christine, I have a question. Yes. Um, it's probably not related to writing, but I just want to ask in logistic regression, how do you check for collinearity 
among the variables. Is it done through chi-square or is it done through simple logistic regression pairwise? Um, no. Um, collinearity is a property of the predictors themselves and isn't actually related to the kind of model you're running. So you can, since this is typically found in um, uh, the uh, procedures for OLS regression, what I typically do is run it as an OLS regression and get the collinearity diagnostics. And I'm not looking at any other part of the output, right? I'm just looking at that because it's a property of the predictors, but it's a property of the predictors taken together, which is why you can't do chi-squared or simple logistic because you've got to have all those predictors together. And that's the important part. But since it's just a property of those predictors and not related to the kind of model you're running, I just run it through OLS regression, even if I was going to run a count model, um, even a multinomial logistic, I would still do uh, something like that to look at uh, collinearity. Although I have to say, um, haven't found collinearity to be a really big problem for a lot of folks. I haven't seen that assumption violated uh, very often. Of all the assumptions uh, that I see violated, that's one of my least, least common ones. And I know when we wrote the um, regression web book, we had to search really hard to find an example of uh, that would show a collinearity problem. So, uh, happily, that's not much, usually not much of an issue, but when you need to check it, that's how you do it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What other questions, please? Hey, Christine. Uh, so can you provide the list of uh, uh, free sources of online classes you mentioned in the beginning of your uh, session today? I can reread them. Would that be helpful? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, because my Zoom has completely crashed at this point. So I don't know if you see me. I definitely do not see you. And I can't put any, I don't even see the chat. So even if I could type them all in the chat. I, I can't even see the chat. So I will just okay. reread them. Okay. Okay. Um, Coursera. Okay. Academic Earth. Mm -hmm. Stanford Online. Mm -hmm. Open Yale Courses. UC Berkeley Class Central. Carnegie Mellon Open Learning Initiative. The Open University. MIT Open Courseware. University of Oxford Podcasts. And then the one I added myself was the State of YouTube channel. Thank you very much. You're welcome. What other questions, please? Maybe this is a bit tangential, but 
are a lot of the changes that you talked about, does that have to do with sort of the open science movement and is a good way to keep track of, um, you know, changes in the offing just to keep an eye out at some of these main open science uh, resources or sites or venues? I don't know of a relationship between these changes and the whole open science movement. Um, my understanding is that a lot of these changes have been inspired by the need to kind of step up our game with respect to research. And so uh, this is another push to improve the process. Now, whether um, uh, participants in the open science movement are, you know, supporting this or not, I don't know. But I haven't heard that in terms of um, any of the stuff that I have been hearing say with respect to the p-value issue with respect to um data confidentiality issues with respect to uh standards of reporting in say sem or meta-analysis i i haven't heard uh of that i all i have seen is kind of a universal desire to improve the research process and the reporting of the results motivated often, I believe, by the failure to replicate important findings in the literature. Uh, there have been a couple of widely publicized articles showing, you know, some of the really big, um, really hyped findings in various fields of research and then finding that they do not replicate. And so um, I, I see that more as the motivation for, for these um, changes and evolutions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Christine. Yes. Uh, I want to ask, um, I'm doing a meta-analysis and uh -huh. um, I want to choose between uh, the guidelines, uh, between Prisma and the Moves. And I'm doing a, a, a meta-analysis on observational studies. So my supervisor suggested Prisma, but I checked both and I see they are both the same. Which one uh, is better or are they the same? Honestly, I would check in the journals where you are hoping to publish to see if they have a preference. My understanding is a lot of the guidelines are very similar, but I will warn you to definitely go through those guidelines very carefully before you start the meta analysis, because you need to be gathering information uh, Go, as you go through the process of collecting your articles. And it's really, really, really difficult to go back and recreate that and capture those numbers. So that all that harping I did about plan, 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 I really, I'm not kidding about that, especially not in a meta-analysis. Know what you need to collect for that flow chart that's going to be required. You know, what databases are you searching? What search terms are you using? What languages? What year spans? Um, all of that. How many do you capture with this? How many do you capture with that? How are you whittling that down to your final sample? You know, um, when you apply, you know, all the different criteria you have, how many studies are getting knocked out at each step? Because you have to provide all of that in the write up of the meta-analysis. And if you don't collect that information as you're going through, <laughs> it is excruciating to go back and try and um, get those numbers. So uh, look at the journals or journals that you're trying to publish in, see what they're using. 
I don't know that it makes a big difference. And I've never seen anybody say, oh, you use those guidelines instead of these guidelines. We're not going to accept your paper. I've never seen anything like that. You know, you can say we followed these guidelines and blah, blah, blah. Um, but read those over very carefully and make sure you collect all the information at every step. And that will save you a lot of time and a lot of frustration. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, we only have a couple more minutes. Any last, any last questions here? Okay, then if not, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Thank you for staying till the bitter end. I hope this, this was useful for you. And um, everybody have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you, you very need, much. Bye-bye. We bye. didn't need the candy to motivate us. <laughs> <laughs> Without the candy, you motivated us. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh -huh.